All right. So we are pretty much done with cells by themselves. Okay, talking about just the cell as a single unit. Now we're going to be looking at multicellular organisms, multicellularity. Plants in particular is what we look at in Science 10. Okay, in Bio 20 is where you start all of your dissections of different things. Okay, um, but what we want to focus on now is the processes that happen at a cellular level, but also happen on a larger scale in a multicellular organism and how they help a multicellular organism to survive. Okay, so don't just think that because something happened only inside of a cell that it's unimportant when we're talking about something larger. Okay, because those processes are still very important because after all we're made up of cells. Okay, but secondly because they still work to some extent on the large scale. Okay, so what we're going to look at today is multicellularity, kind of an introduction to it, how it came about. Okay, the role of this term here, specialization, okay, in multicellularity. Sierra. All right, Sadie, can I have you just turn that front one off? Thanks. Okay, in multicellularity, and we're going to look at the plant as an example of a multicellular organism with specialized cells, okay, and tissues. All right, so if we're looking at the organization of a multicellular organism, okay, we kind of start out with cells, okay, groups of similar cells doing similar jobs are tissue, okay, tissues doing similar jobs, okay, are organs, Organs working together are a system, and systems working together are a multicellular organism. Okay, so that's kind of the hierarchy, okay, of uh, how how things develop, okay, going from single cells to more complex organisms. Okay, so. If we're looking at, let's say, your um, muscles, for example, okay, um, within your muscles there's individual cells. Okay, those cells can form fibers. Right, groups of those cells can form fibers or tissues. Okay, which would then, in groups of those fibers or tissues, would become a single muscle, which we could consider an organ. Okay, and all of the muscles in your body would be your muscular system. Okay, and then obviously your muscular system is part of the entire organism. All right, be a similar thing if you were looking at, let's say, the liver. Okay, you'd have cells within the liver, and there's certain cells in the liver that do certain things. Tissues. Okay, there's different parts of the liver that do certain jobs. The liver works with all the other organs of the digestive system mostly. Okay, uh, and then so, okay, so that would be the digestive system, and then you'd have the digestive system being part of again the whole organism. Everyone, follow me there. Okay, now the other thing we're going to talk about a little bit is this. Okay, we are going to talk a little bit about evolution. Okay, natural selection. And contrary to what you might have thought before today, okay, natural selection and evolution are not mortal enemies with religion. Okay, they are in fact very much alike. Okay, um, and when we had our opening day mass this year, Father Yarick actually talked about how the theory of natural, well, the idea of natural selection and the theory of evolution fit very nicely with what God said about creation. Okay, and it's true. It's 100% true. I've had this explained to me back when I was in university by a priest as well. He said, "What you have to understand is that the Bible, in many cases, is not meant to be taken literally." Okay, a lot of the stuff that happens in the Bible is figurative. Okay, that means that it's a story used to tell you something or to teach you something. Right. Okay. Now, if you're a person who is a fundamentalist, okay, fundamentalists believe in the literal truth of the Bible that everything that happened in the Bible happened exactly as it as it says in the Bible. You will hate everything I say today. Okay, and well, I'm not really sorry. That's going to be your problem. Okay? I'm teaching it the way okay, I was taught to teach this topic in a Catholic school. Okay? They are not the mortal enemies that we think they might be as long as we understand that many parts of the Bible are intended to be a teaching story. Okay? Jesus spoke in parables, right? 
Okay? He often told the story. The story wasn't necessarily true. It was just used to tell, to teach a lesson, like the gospel reading we had this morning okay, about the slave who was left with all of the responsibility and he beat on everybody else, so he got, you know, he got severely punished. Well, that wasn't really a story that happened. Okay? He, was just telling, he was just telling people that if you are, you're given these roles, these responsibilities by God to do these things, so if you don't do them, you're going to have to answer for that later. Okay, you'll be forgiven, but you'll still have to answer for it. Everybody follow me there? All right, so in creation, what's the first thing that happens? Let there be what? Light. Okay, according to science, what's the first thing that happened? Big Bang. I would have to assume that would have been a fairly bright event. Just putting that out there. Okay, the explosion that created the universe and all matter that is currently here would have had to have been a rather exothermic event. Okay, I'm sure it was very, very bright if there was anything around to observe it at the time. Okay, so yeah, sure, let there be light. Okay, and then you know we have to separate the uh, you know the sky, the earth, you know the sea from the sky and the earth from the land and all that kind of stuff. Well, all of that fits kind of in the order that we're going to go over here for how the Earth formed. Okay? The first part of our solar system to form would have been what? The Sun. The Sun was the first part of the solar system to form. Okay? It collected mostly hydrogen. Okay? And as it got uh, more and more hydrogen there, okay, the hydrogen begins to compress under its own weight, under the force of gravity of all of that hydrogen there. And eventually, when you compress hydrogen enough, and you put it under enough pressure, it will fuse. Okay, nuclear fusion will begin. The sun ignites and begins to burn. Okay, it's not a it's not an oxygen feeding fire. It's a nuclear fire. Okay, but it's burning. We now have a source of light. Okay, and shortly thereafter, shortly geologically speaking, a few billion years. Okay, um, other materials begin to collect in various places throughout the solar system. One of those places is Earth. Okay, so solid materials, gases, whatever, all begin to collide, and as they collide, lots of heat happens, and the matter sticks together. Okay, and so we eventually get this conglomeration of material that becomes the Earth. All right, so um, we'll skip over that part and get to here. Okay, so this is what we're looking at here. Around 4.6 billion years ago, the Earth is essentially a solid semi-solid ball. Okay? The outer crust is probably cooled enough okay, that it could be considered semi-solid, but quite molten still, very under, just underneath the surface. Okay? Reason for that? There's a lot more loose material hanging out in the solar system 4.6 billion years ago. Well, between 4.6 and about 16 billion years ago, there was lots more material around, floating around, so collisions were far more common than they are today. Right? Comets would collide with things, you know, meteors and whatever. Okay? Eventually, you get a lessening of the impacts to the point where the Earth can cool enough to have a solid crust. Okay? All right. Then, between 3.9 and 3.5 billion years ago. So for a billion years, the Earth is sort of just cooling. All right. There's some gases surrounding it, okay, but there's no liquid water or anything like that. Okay? Um, when it cools enough, then the gases around it begin to condense. Which gas in particular? Water vapor, right. It begins to condense, it rains down on the surface, it cools the earth even more, and to the point where water can begin to collect on the surface. Okay. Once water was able to collect on the surface, yes, the earth is still warm, there's st still lots of geothermal activity, there's evaporating pools of material that are very rich Okay. in um, you know, sulfur and nitrogen and all the building blocks of life. All right. So, are we still kind of following the idea in Genesis here? Right? We have the creation idea. There was light. There, and we separated this, the earth from the sky. We separated the land from the sea. Okay. And then life begins. Okay. So life begins. Things are very simple. All right. Now it says that that God created created the earth and He filled it with all these with all living things and saw that it was good. Okay. Does it ever say in there that he created everything that's on earth right now at that particular time? No. Okay. God's a pretty smart guy. He would have to know 
that Earth was not going to be a static system. That means an unchanging system. He knew it was going to be dynamic. He knew it was going to go through changes. That was part of his plan. Yeah, right? um, so he had to make life adaptable. He had to make it so that the life that he put there wouldn't die if something were to happen and the Earth were to change. Okay? So God's the guy who thought up natural selection. Okay? Darwin put it on paper, but God's the guy that thought it up. Okay? He figured out that if something has an advantage over something else, it will survive and it will reproduce more offspring than the other thing will. Okay? And eventually, the less adapted organism will simply disappear. Okay? It's off, it won't reproduce as often and pretty soon its genetic material will no longer be in the population and you'll only have this superior breed okay, that is left. That's kind of how natural selection works. If, for example, let's say you had these, um, uh, let's say, pack of wolves, okay? And in this pack of wolves, uh, a couple of offspring are born who can see in the dark way better than all the others, okay? Is that going to give them an advantage over the others? Okay, so will they catch more food? Will they be stronger? Yes. Will they reproduce more often as a result? Most likely. Okay, that's how nat natural selection leads to evolution. Okay, evolution is the gradual changing of an organism into something else over many, many generations. All right. So as this gene that's coded for really good eyesight, okay, begins to uh, get reproduced, the gene that is for not as good of eyesight doesn't reproduce as often, and eventually it just disappears. Okay. Hopefully the gene for a good eyesight is dominant to the one that's not, and it just begins to appear more often until every organism has it. Okay, and the rest, that other gene is simply gone. Right? We see that when we look at like pictures, you know, in the in the Terrell Museum of how you know this organism slowly changed into something else. Okay, that's that's kind of the idea. All right, how you know maybe horns evolved to get longer on the on uh, you know the the Triceratops types of, of dinosaurs and things like that. Okay, does that sort of make sense how that process works? Okay. All right, so for a billion years, it takes a billion years essentially for the Earth to cool off enough, okay, for situations to be right for life to appear. All right, now this isn't very complex life. We're talking probably like blue green algae, all right, simple prokaryotic organisms that are photosynthetic. Okay, and they would have been about the only thing that would have been around in the soupy oceans that would have been, okay, on Earth at that time. All right. For about another okay, uh, billion years or so, that's all that's on there. That's all that's on Earth. Okay? Why? Because that's all the raw materials the Earth has can support. Carbon dioxide, okay, water, sunlight. That was really about all there was. Okay? It takes a long time for these little photosynthetic organisms to build up any significant amounts of oxygen. Okay? Yeah, about a billion years or so. All right, so photosynthesizing bacteria are pumping large amounts of oxygen into the atmosphere. Okay? When that happens, there's less carbon dioxide, so there's less of a greenhouse effect, and a massive cooling trend occurs. Okay? Now, that's good and bad. The Earth was a little hot, okay? so having it cool off is okay, but that kills off a lot of organisms. All right? So there's kind of a massive die-off here. Okay? An ice age grips the polar regions, bacteria become a bit more complex. All right? So we're looking kind of now beyond blue-green algae. Maybe there's some other shapes of bacteria, okay? other niches for them to fill, okay? things like that. Everyone with me so far? All right. Now, there comes very shortly hereafter a tipping point. We've still got all these photosynthetic organisms. We don't really have any other organisms out there that are just consuming the oxygen because there's not enough of it. But there becomes a tipping point where the oxygen becomes toxic to many of the organisms that are living on the Earth. Their own waste product, oxygen, ends up killing them. There's a mass extinction, okay, and it's only a bacteria, okay, not that that's not tragic, but, okay, there's a mass extinction of many of the organisms living on Earth at that time because the oxygen level gets so high it becomes toxic to them and they die off. So, those ones die off, but the ones that can tolerate the oxygen, they survive. And what do they do? They reproduce, okay, and they, some mutations happen, things like that, some changes, new organisms are produced that are tolerant to the oxygen, okay, and the niches that were emptied by the ones that went extinct are filled again, and things take off. That's, again, natural selection 
causing changes okay, that lead to new organisms being developed. All right, so between 2.8 and 2.5, that's kind of what's going on. Between 2.1 and 1.9 billion years ago, that's where the oxygen build. Large, single-celled organisms appear, okay? We're getting our first eukaryotic organisms around that time, and, okay, multicellular organisms begin to show up. How do we know that all this is happening at those times? Fossil record, okay? With the uh, the invention of the electron microscope and better imaging techniques, we're actually able to carry out what's called micro paleontology, and we can look at rocks and find microscopic okay, um, fossils that we can observe, and we can know their structure and compare them to similar organisms, and whatever. All right, so we get our first kind of multi-celled life originating there. Okay, now about a billion years ago, okay, so multi multicellular organisms appear right about here. Now, this line here that you see, you see how it gets wider? The width of it represents the diversity of life on Earth. Okay, that means how many different kinds of organisms there are on planet Earth. All right? Now, you'll notice that that line stays relatively thin for three and a half billion years or so. But once multicellular life appears, what happens to the width of that line? It explodes, okay? Because multicellular organisms are specialized, okay? They can get very large, okay? They can fill niches that could not otherwise be filled, okay? They can adapt a little more readily, all right? So once multicellular organisms appeared, life really took off, all right? So about a billion years ago, we're starting to get kind of our first animals, okay? Things like that, okay? They would have been like sponges, Okay, if you've ever seen a real sponge, a sponge is an animal. Okay, it doesn't look much like an animal, but it is. Okay, it filter feeds water and takes particles out of the water to, to eat. Okay, uh, those would have been kind of our first life. Okay, they kind of look a bit like this as well here. Okay, these are sponges. All right, and then we'd have got kind of our first shellfish. Okay, our gastropods and things like that. All right, and then the arthropods start showing up. Okay, the arthropods are things like the trilobites, okay, and organisms that are in that family. Okay, they have segmentation, they have uh, paired appendages, right, so legs and mouth parts and things like that. Okay, so the first kind of insects, even though they were underwater, okay, insects are arthropods, right, so, you know, ancestors of the lobster and crab and things like that would start to appear and that's where things like we say really really took off you get all kinds of different types of organisms you get um, echinoderms like the starfish and sand dollars and, and things like that they also appeared around that time okay again where is basically all the life in the ocean land is still barren around this time all right there's obstacles to living on land that hadn't been overcome yet by natural selection and evolution. The main obstacle, the availability of water. All right? When you live in the ocean, water's not an issue. It's everywhere. All right? But when you get onto land, the availability of water is an issue. You've got to be able to keep water in you, acquire water when you need it, and protect yourself from the sun. All right? and, and so those are major kind of blockets, blockages to advancing beyond that point. About let's say 750 million years ago or so, you start getting plants colonizing the land, okay, and about another 100,000 years after that, or sorry, 100 million years after that, you get animals starting to follow them, all right, so you get, you know, let's say about 500 million years ago is when the fish are crawling out of the ocean and onto the land, okay, the little lungfish and whatever. Okay, point being, it's a slow process. Right? 4.6 billion years is a long time to get where we are. All right? Now, what's the last thing to appear? Last organism to appear? Humans. Okay? On the sixth day, God created man. Last thing. Because on the seventh day, he rested. Okay? It's a lot of work, you know, creating all that stuff. All right? Now, again, the seven days is only an analogy for 4.6 billion years. Okay, you have to imagine at the time the Bible was written, if you'd have told people this, what I've just told you, and all the processes, you probably would have had rocks thrown at you until you were dead. Okay, that's what they call stoning someone. Right? Yeah, you probably would not have, wouldn't have gone over well because most people couldn't read, they weren't educated, you know, things like that. They wouldn't have understood it. Okay, 
But seven days was a sacred amount of time for people, okay? Because the Sabbath day was very important, okay? And so it made sense to say, well, here's a time frame you understand. Here's the order in which things happened. And that was fine, okay? As long as we understand it's an analogy for what really happened, okay? Everyone good with that? Okay, back to this thing here about um, multicellular organisms. Okay, multicellularity actually evolved several times, right, among different groups. Okay, among the plants, among the animals, and among the fungi. Okay, multicellularity evolved different different ways at different times. So we had these different branches kind of of the tree of life here. That's kind of what this is showing. Okay, we've got the different kinds of algae. Okay, are kind of ancestral organism here, okay, that led to the development of different types of, of life, okay. Now, um, the most widely held view here, guys, is that uh, the links between multicellular organisms and unicellular ancestors were colonies, okay, or loose aggregates of interconnected cells, right. To be a true multicellular organism, you have to have cells that do this job and another group of cells that do this job. We call that specialization. If you are just a group of interconnected cells, then you are a colony, okay, rather than a true multicellular organism. Okay. Right. So this picture here would be not a true multicellular organism. Okay. Why? Because all the cells are the same, okay? Every one of these cells has got to acquire food for itself. Every one of these cells has got to digest its own food, get rid of its own waste, okay? Sure, they live together, and probably some material can diffuse from one cell to another, and certainly there's an advantage to living in a group. You're a little bit bigger. Maybe you're less, less of a prey item for small predators, things like that, but it, there's no specialization here. Right? And without specialization, you do not have a true multicellular organism. All right? A sponge is a true multicellular organism. Okay? It does have cells that are specialized for certain jobs. Some of them are designed for capturing food. Some of them are designed for transporting that food, okay? et cetera, et cetera. So there are different types of tissue within there. All right. Um, Ah, we'll talk about the uh, different types of plant cells here in just a sec. All right, so evolution kind of increased cellular specialization. Specialization was a clear advantage over being unspecialized. If you had groups of cells that were doing a job, they were probably doing it far better than a generalized cell could have done it. All right, and so specialization was a huge advantage, which is why when the first true multicellular organisms appeared, that diversity line got really, really wide, okay, because it would have been a huge advantage over everything else. All right, so initially in the colonial aggregates, all cells, you know, could have maybe been mobile and had flagella, okay. The cells in the colony would tend to become increasingly interdependent on some of, and so then some of the cells might have lost their flagella and become more proficient in performing functions. That's kind of the evolutionary process that would have led to, okay, the development of true specialization. All right, so these are pictures or artists' representations of what Earth would have looked like very early on. Okay, now, um, you can see here, there would have been a lot more meteor activity, right, because there was still a lot more stuff floating around, okay, in the solar system, hitting other things, okay. And what do you notice about the moon here? Why is it so big? Okay, how did it form? Right. Yes. The giant impact hypothesis is the most uh, credible idea for how the moon formed. About, uh, I think they were saying it was about 5 billion or 6 billion years ago or so, the, um, as the Earth was forming, it wasn't quite as big as it is today, okay, it was hit by about a Mars-sized object, okay? Now, it wasn't a direct hit, it was a glancing blow, okay? So they kind of came in like this, and one kind of hit the other, kind of glancing off. But because they were both still fairly molten when that happened, okay, they kind of congealed together. But a lot of the debris from the surface of the Earth was thrown out around the Earth, okay? And it all came together and formed the moon, all right? Everyone with me there? 
Okay? The idea, uh, the sort of confirmation of that is that the moon, for its size, is very light. Right? It should have, if it came from the Earth, a similar composition to the Earth. Okay? Or sorry, if it sorry, if it formed separately from the Earth, from the same material, its composition should be about the same. The Earth or the Moon's composition is mostly made of material we find near the surface of the Earth rather than the stuff we find in the center of the Earth, like iron and things like that. So the Moon is actually kind of light for something its size. Now, when the astronauts in the Apollo missions came back with their samples from the Moon, that was confirmed. Okay, that yes, the Moon is actually made of these materials. It's exact. It's this age. Okay, and that kind of helped to confirm this idea of the giant impact hypothesis. Now. What that means, though, is that when the moon initially formed, it was also much closer to the Earth. Okay? And in fact, because there's little mirrors on the moon that the Apollo astronauts left there, okay, laser beams are constantly sent to those mirrors and reflected back. And the moon is getting farther away from the Earth all the time, at a rate of about 2 centimeters a year. Okay? Not very much, okay? but it's getting further and further away it'll eventually leave. But around that time, the sun will also be gone and there'll be bigger fish to fry. Okay? But early on, with the moon being this close, how would that affect the Earth? Yeah, tides would be a lot different. Okay? I mean, if you go to the Bay of Fundy, right, the tides can, can move a few kilometers. Okay? Has anyone ever been out to the Bay of Fundy on the East Coast? Okay? It's got the highest tides in the world, right? It's, it's those pictures you saw in your like, junior high textbooks where there's boats and they're floating, and then the next picture is the same boat sitting on the ground because okay? the tide has gone out. All right? Well, imagine if the moon was twice as close. Would its pull on the ocean be a lot greater? Yeah, okay. We'd be talking that tides would be coming in maybe even hundreds of kilometers. All right? So there were these huge tidal areas that had you know, periodic presence of water, absence of water, okay, those were great places for life, okay, to sort of begin, all right, is in these tidal pools, all right, where there's constantly being a fresh um, supply of, of nutrients being brought in and then released and, and things like that. So um, all of that would have contributed, okay, to the development of life on Earth. Yes, the moon being closer to the Earth would have also probably contributed to a little more volcanic activity as well, okay, pulling on, on the Earth. Um, okay, so we see uh, in all of these pictures, volcanoes erupting and things like that. Yes, there would have been a lot more volcanic activity early on in the Earth's history because the Earth was still cooling, crust wasn't quite as thick, okay, things like that. All right, different types of cells. We're going to look at the cells within plants here that are specialized to do kind of certain jobs. I'm never going to test you on the actual names. This is just to kind of show you examples here. All right, now, parenchyma cells are actually unspecialized. That's how they're specialized, that they're unspecialized. Okay? Um, they have thin cell walls, and those cells carry out most of the plant's metabolic functions. They contain large numbers of chloroplasts for photosynthesis and fibers okay, for support. So they're just sort of a general type of plant cell. Okay? So we can see them here. Okay? They don't have any particular shape. They're just kind of rounded. Right? But these cells also have the ability to become specific types of cells okay, for the plant. Typically, we find these in the stems and in the buds okay, of a plant. So if, let's say, uh, uh, a cow comes along or a deer comes along and chews off a few branches on, on a plant, okay, will that plant grow back? Yes, it will. From where? From lower down. Okay, so if you have a, a plant, okay, like this, and it's got some branches, you know, and there's branching kind of points here, right, you usually see buds kind of right in here in the spots where the branches come off, right? If a deer comes along and chews off these two branches, the plant will grow from back here. It can't grow from the branches you cut off. Okay, it can grow from any buds that are back from there. All right, so a new branch will begin to grow from that bud because that bud contains these parenchyma cells, also known as stem cells. 
That's where the name comes from. They're unspecialized cells that can become anything. Okay? They can become leaf tissue. They can become vascular tissue. They can become whatever the plant needs them to become based on a chemical signal from the plant. Actually, if you look at the plants now, you will see the buds from that they will grow from in the spring. They actually grow them through the summer, but you don't see them because the leaves are on. Right? They can't grow them through the winter because they can't photosynthesize during the winter. So they're actually all on there already. Okay? Um, this is also the reason why if you have a hedge, you want to trim it regularly. Okay? If you trim a hedge regularly, you force it to grow from just a little bit further back from where you've trimmed it. And that makes the outer part of the hedge really full. Because right? it'll usually grow leaf tissue right near the outside. Okay? If you don't leave a hedge, if you don't, sorry, if you leave a hedge and you don't trim it, it just gets long and stringy. Okay? Because it just keeps growing longer and longer branches. If you keep cutting those branches off, it grows more small branches from further back and makes the plant look much more full. Okay? Prime example is these two plants right here. Okay? This plant you can see is kind of stringy and only growing on one side. Or this one okay, is kind of more even all the way around. Okay? It's because this one we're actually going to use in a lab that we're going to do later. Okay? Um, and we trim it off all the time. So it always has to grow from a little bit further back and ends up being kind of round. The other reason is I also turn this one periodically. So a different side of it faces the light source. This one I never turn. So it only grows on the one side. It doesn't do it any good to grow leaves over here against the wall where they don't get any sun. Right, so there's kind of adaptations there. All right. Now, water conducting cells. Okay, the cells that are in the xylem tubes, the tubes that conduct water, okay, are specialized not so much for photosynthesis because that's not really their job. Okay, that and they're usually in the middle of the stem where they wouldn't get any light anyway. Okay, but they've got to fit tightly together to prevent leakage. So they have a very specific shape. They also tend to have a lot more um, fiber in them. Okay, because they got to be strong. They got to support okay the shape of the plant because they're part of the stem. Okay, bigger water vacuoles, more turgor pressure, right? Things like that. So they are definitely specialized and different from let's say the cells you looked at yesterday that were part of the leaf. Okay, those cells were stacked really, really close together. Okay, in order to carry out as much photosynthesis as possible. Where that's not the job of these cells. Okay, now if they don't carry out photosynthesis, where do they get their sugar from? Right, the cells that do carry out photosynthesis. Okay, they carry out photosynthesis, they produce sugar, that sugar comes back through the phloem tubes, which are a different set of tubes, okay, um, and they are supplied with it that way. That's interdependency, okay? So when you have a plant or an organism that's specialized, all of the different tissues and different specialized cells are dependent on each other because sometimes they can't do a certain job. Okay, they do this job and they're really, really good at it, but they can't do that one. All right, it's like, um, you know, if if you're a doctor, your specialization is to help people who are sick and you know, and to you know, fix injuries and things like that. But you probably have to take your car to the mechanic because maybe you don't know how to fix it. You're not. That's not your training. Your training is to fix people, not cars. Okay. So we're all in a community here in the town. Some people are fixing cars. Some people are fixing people. Other people are digging ditches, other people make sure we always have power, other people make sure we always have water. Okay? We're all dependent on each other. Agreed? That's kind of what it works like here. All right. Food conducting cells. These are the cells that are in the phloem. Okay? The phloem is different because the tubes that conduct water are conducting a, a liquid that's very thin. But the tubes that are conducting the sugar are conducting a fluid that's very, very viscous. All right? In fact, it's got about the consistency of like really thin syrup, right? Maple syrup. Okay, if you've ever had, you know, poured like warm maple syrup, right? It, it pours pretty easily. If it gets cold, it's a little bit thicker. Okay, that's about the consistency of the phloem sap because, after all, what is maple syrup? Maple syrup. It's tree sap. Yeah. Okay, from a maple tree with some other ingredients, obviously. Okay, but okay, the plant produces sugar, and that sugar goes through these phloem tubes. Now, there's problems with transporting a viscous fluid through tubes. 
if you start to get any crystallization happening inside of the tubes, okay, it will very quickly cause a blockage. Right? Because once you get one crystal, crystals tend to grow around that crystal. Right? So what typically happens is there are things called sieve plates within these tubes. They're groups of specialized cells that essentially are like a, a screen. And so what happens is if a crystal forms, it'll hit that screen, and then the weight of the sap above it will break the crystal up and allow it to fit through the holes in the sieve, and that keeps it from getting blocked. All right. Um, all right. Okay, now this is a diagram that's going to come back many, many times. I'm, I believe I put it in your notes, right? A picture of the leaf? All right. Okay, this is the best example of specialized cells and tissues in an organism that you will see in this course. All right. When we looked at the leaf yesterday, this is what we saw. Agreed? Under the microscope, right? We saw this. Okay, you got this upper layer here, all right, which is called okay, the epidermis. Right? The epidermal cells are basically responsible for um, producing the waxy cuticle. If you've ever felt the surface of a leaf, it feels kind of waxy. Right? That's because it is, in fact, covered with wax. What does wax do for the plant? Helps water roll off of it and also keeps water inside of it. Okay? Back before the days of all the different kinds of lip balm, there was only one kind of lip balm and it was called chapstick. And it was just wax. Okay? You basically took a candle and rubbed it on your lips. Okay? Because the, the wax would keep the moisture in your lips and that would get rid of your chapped lips. All right? well, plants use exactly the same idea. There's this waxy cuticle that prevents water from evaporating from all the plant's surfaces. If a plant doesn't have a waxy cuticle, it'll be like a moss. Okay? A moss does not have a waxy cuticle. If you put a moss in the sun, what happens to it? It just cooks dry. Okay? It just cooks right up because it has no cuticle and water just evaporates from it very, very quickly. That's why you typically only see mosses growing on the floor of a very thick forest. Okay? All right, so that's what the epidermal cells do. Their job, not to carry out photosynthesis. In fact, you probably saw through the microscope yesterday that they didn't have any chloroplasts in them. They were relatively clear, All right? That's because their only job is to produce this waxy cuticle. Below them were those palisade cells that we were supposed to draw, okay? And in the palisade layer, okay, these cells are stacked really, really, really close together so that we can get as many cells in that layer as possible because the job of that layer is to carry out photosynthesis. That is the main photosynthetic layer of the leaf, okay, is this palisade layer, okay, that's what we call it, the palisade layer, okay. Reason we call it palisade is it looks like rock formations called palisades that make these column-like rocks. Okay? Now, below that is the spongy layer. Right? Still has photosynthetic cells, but their job isn't so much photosynthesis because it's the bottom of the leaf now. And the bottom of the leaf is always in the shade. Okay? Um, but what this part of the leaf does is it helps with the exchange of gases and the control of evaporation. Right? So inside of this layer, there's little cells called stomates, okay? or sorry, little structures called stomates that are made up of guard cells that can open and close and allow water to evaporate during photosynthesis. So again, very specialized cells. These guard cells can change their shape because their water vacuoles can fill and drain very quickly. And when the water vacuole drains, the cell loses its shape because it can't push against the cell wall anymore. All right? So during the day, okay, in the morning, these guard cells are full of water. Their water vacuoles are full of water and the stomate is open. But during the day, as water evaporates, the guard cells' water vacuoles empty and they lose their ability to hold their shape and the stomate closes. And that stops evaporation and it stops the plant from getting overly dry. Okay? But again, a specialized cell doing a job. Okay? And then sort of in the middle, okay, uh, you may have seen these as well. You may have seen the tubes that we just talked about, okay? The xylem, the one that conducts the water, and the phloem, the one that conducts the sugar, okay? Because they would have stained kind of a reddish color uh, under the microscope, okay? So um, what we're talking about here, leaf structure, I would say this you should know because I'm going to ask about this all the time. In fact, I can't remember, whoa, a test where I did not have... A question about the layers of the leaf. Okay, because not only does it ask 
what you know about plants. It also goes back to this idea about specialization. So this diagram and this slide here okay, are definitely something you're going to want to review. <coughs> All right, there's also an epidermal layer on the bottom of the leaf okay, because we want to, again, have both sides of the leaf sealed up so that water can't evaporate except out of these little holes, okay, the stomates. Okay, so substances enter and leave the, the uh, leaf by two routes, veins and stomates, right? So the veins contain the phloem and the xylem, where the water, okay, and the, and the sugar move. So water comes in through the xylem and sugar leaves through the phloem, right? And then gases leave through the stomates, right? So carbon dioxide comes in through the stomates, Oxygen and water vapor leave through the stomates. All right, everyone with me there? Right. Now, a plant cannot carry out photosynthesis if water is not evaporating or if the stomates are closed. Okay, because if the stomates are closed, what can it not take in? Carbon dioxide. Okay, that's how the carbon dioxide gets in, is through the stomates. Okay, when carbon dioxide is processed, water vapor is produced. And the water vapor will escape through the open stomates. Okay, but as soon as those stomates close, water can't evaporate, carbon dioxide can't get in, photosynthesis is done. And that's how a plant will preserve water. Under times of stress, okay, let's say, you know, we get a week of 35 degrees Celsius weather. Plants are not going to be carrying out a lot of photosynthesis during those times because it will use up too much water. Okay? So you'll tend to see, you know, people's lawns start to get kind of burnt, right? They appear a, little, a lot less green, a little more brown. It's because they go into this protection kind of mode and they go dormant until the water comes back. All right. So important to know, again, what those stomates do. Okay, the stomates reach into the spongy layer where there's water, okay, and allow that exchange of gases to occur. All right, here's how the stomates work. This is another one you definitely want to know because I often ask on exams how the plant controls its water loss, and this is how it does it. Okay, it has the cuticle, that helps, okay, but the stomates are the biggest way it controls the amount of water that's lost because those can be opened and closed. So, this is what they look like under a light microscope. Okay, the stomate looks like this. Here's each, one, each side of the stomate is a guard cell, right? And those guard cells, when there's lots of water going in, will have a bean shape, all right? Because they'll have so much turgor pressure that it kind of twists and bends the, the cell so that the stomate is now open, okay? Carbon dioxide can go in. Throughout the day, like we said, okay, the water evaporates, so water is now leaving these guard cells. They become a bit more flaccid. They can't hold the shape anymore, and that closes off the stomate. Now carbon dioxide can't get in. Water can't get out. The stomate is closed, okay, as you can see down here, and the plant no longer carries out any photosynthesis. Okay, it also then never loses any water. All right, so... Now, what cellular process do you suppose pulls the water in? Osmosis. Because as the water is leaving, okay, salts will increase in concentration on the inside of the cell. Right? Now, the water is leaving because of evaporation. It has nothing to do with salt concentration why it leaves. It leaves due to evaporation. Okay? But it comes back in because of osmosis. Overnight, when there's no more evaporation going on, okay, the salts are in there, they're very heavy, boom, water starts moving back in to balance them through osmosis. Okay, so again, those cellular transport processes are important when we're talking about a whole organism as well. All right, I want you to answer those four questions and we'll go through those here in a few minutes. Yes. All right. Let's go over these here. Okay, so why was multicellularity so superior to unicellularity? What competitive advantage did it serve? One thing that we did talk about and one thing that I forgot to mention. What's the one thing that we did talk about? Why, why it had an advantage? Right, 
Specialization was don't use blue on red on blue. Come on, go there. Okay, specialization. Yes. That was certainly one of the main advantages. Okay? The other advantage was it allowed them to overcome the surface area to volume problem. Okay? You can only get so big as a single cell before your volume outstrips your surface area, right? We did that lab on that earlier. Right? By the way, that lab is due soon. Make sure you have that done. Okay? Um, but the surface area to volume ratio problem was overcome. Because none of your cells are very big, but you have lots of them, and that allows you to get big. And quite frankly, in evolutionary history, bigger has been better on many occasions. All right? It hasn't always been. All right? 65 million years ago, bigger was not better. All right? Most of the things that survived the Cretaceous extinction were actually small. All right? But okay, for the most part, being bigger has usually been superior to being small. All right. Number two, how are the cells of a leaf different from cells found in the stem of a plant? Is this a specialization question? Okay, so what are the cells in a leaf primarily designed to do? What do they carry out? Photosynthesis. But the cells in the stem are basically doing what? Supporting the plant. So cells in the stem have to have more cellulose. They've got to have bigger water vacuoles. They usually also have lignin in their cell walls, which is something we'll talk about later that helps um, make them stronger. Okay, uh, they're they're simply specialized to do a different job. Okay, one's carrying out photosynthesis. One's carrying out transport of material, water and sugar, and supporting the height of the plant. All right. How do the epidermis and stomates have similar jobs? Well, epidermis and stomates are both trying to conserve what resource? Water. Right? The stomates do it by opening and closing and controlling the amount of, ev of evaporation and thus controlling the amount of photosynthesis. The epidermis, what does it do? Right, it, it secretes the waxy cuticle, okay? That waxy covering that covers the leaf and prevents evaporation from all surfaces. Okay, so they have similar jobs, but they do them slightly different. All right, and describe how the stomate works. Well, that's that whole water balance thing we talked about. In the mornings when the water vacuoles are full, okay, the stomates are open and photosynthesis is occurring. Throughout the day, as evaporation occurs, the water vacuoles become drained, okay? Because as evaporation occurs, the salt concentration in the cytoplasm goes up as water is drawn out of the cell. So water gets drawn out of the water vacuole through osmosis. Through the night, as water begins to move back in, okay, water will move back into the uh, water vacuoles as well. All right. So really important that we understand how that stomate works because that's probably something you'll be asked to explain on the unit exam. I think I've said that three times today now, right? All right, well, that's 